Yay, yay. Good morning. Welcome. Wel welcome back. Back where we belong, back where we left off. Did you, um, did you happen to see the sunset last night, anybody? It was this amazing blood-red sun sort of sliced in half, and, and I, I thought, wow, what is in the air that it's doing that to the sun? And, and I think the right answer was it's particulate from fires and all sorts of ominous post-apocalyptic things. But I choose to say that what's in the air was promise and hope, because that's the way I'm looking at, um, I'm looking at this year. I think it's going to be great. And as, as, I, as we left in June, I was thinking, wow, this, this whole summer uh, ahead of us, and suddenly we're on the other side of it. And I'm thinking, was summer, was, that, was it a dream? Was it just a dream? Well, we are nothing but not dreamers here at, at UU, and Shel Silverstein has something to say about this. He said, if you were a dreamer, come in. If you were a dreamer, a wisher, a liar, a hoper, a prayer, a magic bean buyer. If you're a pretender, come sit by the fire, for we have some flax golden tails to spin. So good to be with you. Please stand as you are able for the gathering song. Again, my name is Bruce Grierson, and I am your service coordinator this, this morning. And I'm part of a team of five of five service associates uh, who were the same ones who were, who were serving you last year, and we're all returning except for one, and that's Dennis Cooper, who sadly, well, not sadly for him, had to go move to the island for work, missing him already in Victoria. But Rebecca and Sue and Leslie and Allison and I are here for you with assists from others too numerous to mention, you know who you are and everyone else knows who they are. In this community, we celebrate people from all walks of life. We take it as a simple truth that people don't have to believe together to love together. No matter what brought you here, no matter what you do for your beans and bread, no matter how you experience the sacred, 
No matter who you are or who you love, we hope you feel at home here, here on the traditional unceded land of the Coast Salish peoples. And in the spirit of their example, may we be good stewards of the environment and good ancestors to our children. And now it's time to light the chalice. Flaming chalice is the symbol of Unitarian Universalism. We light it each week with a simple spark to make holy our time together. It is, as the Reverend Rebecca Savage put it, an act of aspiration, an act of hope. Hope that our highest intentions be refreshed, that our commitment be renewed, that we remember who we are. We kindle this flame as a symbol of our gathering. We do two more candles. The first is the candle of joys and sorrows. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm certain you had both over the course of your summer, too many to mention here. Um, did anyone have any particular joys you want to just shout out, a birth of a grandchild, something great that happened? My grandchildren were here for the weekend. Hey. My grandchild was from Yay! Yes, you did. And Sonia? I have a new called Bo. Bo! <coughs> Fantastic. Um, Soros, as you may know, we lost Frances Pretty very suddenly about three weeks ago. We'll miss her smile, we'll miss her laugh, her singing voice. We will miss her. And Catherine Nicholson, um, in her first real test as the new lay chaplain, did a magnificent job with that, with that uh, service last weekend. The candle of global concerns. It's hard to know where to begin with that one. War in Ukraine, war in Gaza, a far-right government poised to rule in Germany for the first time since World War II. Could go either way, elections looming in the US and Canada and right here in BC. The world feels unstable. And sometimes, at a time like this, the only response is just to sit with that, all of it. So I'm going to invite us right now to observe two minutes of silence. Just let your heart take you where it wants to go.
So a Unitarian friend was speaking with an observant Jew the other day, and an analogy came up I thought was worth sharing. They were comparing religion, and the Jewish gentleman said, you know, here's the difference between us. Judaism is an inch wide and a mile deep, whereas your Unitarianism is a mile wide and an inch deep. And it was kind of clear which was the better way to be if you claim to be a serious person. Now you probably hear some version of that a lot. When Jen and I got married 23 years ago, we picked a Unitarian minister to do the ceremony. We weren't Unitarian at the time, it just seemed like the best compromise, like it would offend as few people as possible, <laughs> the, the, the people of deep faith and the people for whom science is their faith. Theologically, it was a bushy enough beard. And that's how a lot of folks think of us, kind of woolly and wild. A lot of newcomers to a Unitarian service half, service half expect a hippie, to, a hippie pastor to close it all down with the words, whatever and ever and ever, amen. <laughs> so what, what should Unitarian sermons be about? This was a question to you, you homiletics teacher, and this was his advice. Sermons should be about something sacred and about 20 minutes. And our observant Jewish friend is shaking his head, bemused, and going, Oh, I get it. You, you. That's the footprints of a unicorn standing on its hind legs. <laughs> you people amuse the devils with your wild moderation. And we're going, Yeah, but we aren't actually about nothing. We have our eight principles, and our six sources, and our five aspirations. And our Jewish friend's like, Yeah, choose your own adventure, baby. Might as well call it the seven habits of painfully earnest do-gooders who read a lot of book reviews but no actual books. <laughs> so, what is our defense against these charges that we are just inherently flaky? Is there one? Foxes and hedgehogs. Have you heard this construction? Okay, so it comes from an old Greek myth and was popularized by the philosopher Isaiah Berlin. It says, people are either foxes or they're hedgehogs. And here's the difference. The fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows one big thing. So the question when you hear that is, which am I? Which is, it, which is it better to be? So the hedgehogs look like the real leaders among us. They're decisive, they have one worldview. Christianity and Islam, the two largest religions on earth, these are, these are hedgehog faiths. One God, one holy book. A visitor walking in through the front door of a cathedral or a mosque gets it pretty much straight away. We are a fox faith, nose to the wind. We're sort of spiritual opportunists. And as soon as I say that, it makes it sound, sound kind of shifty and shallow. The world prefers specialists to generalists. And I get it. Hey, I don't want a poet taking out my gallbladder. I, I may not want, if I'm our straw man observant Jew in the intro there, a Unitarian leading me on a wilderness hike with UU spiritual coordinates plugged into Google Maps. But I'm going to declare a personal bias here, one that probably inclined me to this faith before I even knew what Unitarian Universalism was. I like generalists. I am a generalist. For many, many years, I was a general assignment reporter for general interest magazines, and this suited my temperament. I mean, I've got, I've got some ADHD features, so I, I get very hot for subjects I know nothing about, and I absolutely relish that first part of the learning curve. I call it climbing Mount Stupid. <laughs> you, you, you hoover up as much knowledge as you can, and then you call up experts in the field, whether that field is leatherback turtles or fell running or tidal energy, and then you call up the people who think those people don't know what they're talking about. And in the end, you have something passably authoritative that managed to catch lightning in a bottle, the furious, curious energy, and the fresh perspective of the beginner's mind. And that's a good thing, I think, as long as you don't confuse it with actual expertise. What it is is a sizzler. It's an invitation. You, sir, take your newly kindled interest in this thing further if you wish, and maybe even fashion a hedgehog out of it. Until you go, wow, the world is so cool. Shame I only have one lifetime. What I appreciated most about general interest magazines reading them and writing, writing for them was that you almost always found something that you weren't looking for.
you didn't know you were looking for. So yeah, the world loves hedgehogs, it understands hedgehogs, it wants us all to be hedgehogs, but some of us don't want to be hedgehogs. Some of us would rather be foxes, because the fox has some unique ways to tackle life's problems. Robert Heinlein, some will know that name, greatest science fiction writer of all time, and I would say one of the most influential writers of all time, period, said this, a human being should be able to change a diaper, con a ship, design a building, write a sonnet, balance accounts, build a wall, set a bone, comfort the dying, take orders, give orders, cooperate, act alone, solve equations, pitch manure, program a computer, cook a tasty meal, fight efficiently, die gallantly. Specialization is for insects. <laughs> okay, I, I edited that a bit. It was, it was even a little more macho than that. And I also don't know what conning a ship is. Does anyone? How do you con a ship? Is it? Is it? Okay. Anyway, thank you, Marsha. But I think, I think he's on to something. And Diane Ackerman, who is, as a writer, as sensual as Heinlein is rational, would agree. She said this, the great affair, the love affair with life, is to live as variously as possible, to groom one's curiosity like a high-spirited thoroughbred, climb aboard and gallop away every day. Life began in mystery, it will end in mystery, but what a savage and beautiful country lies in between. That's nice. And by the way, have you noticed, we, you use, we quote a lot of people. I've heard, I've heard folks go, why, do you, why are you use always quoting people? Why don't you just learn to say what you want to say better? <laughs> well, there's a reason, I think, to, to bring in great minds from the past and, and great minds from all faith, faiths. And that reason is humility, I would say, spiritual humility. We, you, use hold no corner on that. The rabbi Shea held said, I love that when you ask me a question, I can go, well, Maimonides said something here that's really helpful. Maimonides, the 12th century Jewish philosopher. It's probably worthwhile letting history's wisest people get their two cents in. Einstein referred to folks like that as geniuses of the spirit. Jesus, the Buddha, Mo Moses, Confucius. They are there for all of us, but they're not coming out unless we knock. Now, you've heard me uh, on this hobby horse before, but I think some of the wisest people of our own time are film critics. Because they have taken in more art than anyone else, arguably. You can watch two films a day for your whole life, but you probably can't read two books and you won't visit two museums. And film critics watch everything, foreign films, blockbusters, the high and the low, so they are the ultimate foxes. And the very best of them, in my opinion, the wisest and most soulful film fox was this guy, Roger, Roger Ebert, one half of the thumbs up, thumbs down pair. I read his reviews for decades and I tried to get a beat on his faith until one day he addressed it directly in a column. He said, I have no spiritual affiliation, I just have values. If he had a faith, he wondered, what would it be? So Roger went to the belief o -matic. Have you heard of this? The belief o -matic. You're going to want to look this up. It was created by BeliefNet magazine, and it's a test you take. It gathers up your answers to a survey and runs them through an algorithm and matches you with a belief system that's a good fit for you. And I, I, can, I, can, I have this quiz, I can give it to you later if you want. <laughs> and then you can know if you're in the right place. The belief o -matic. so there are 27 religions and belief systems in the database. So Roger Ebert, he takes the test. Turns out he's the best match by far for Unitarian Universalism. <laughs> A 92% match, followed by Quakers, 80% match, and Theravada Buddhists, 71% match. So the fox, the film, aka the film critic here, has seen, has seen a lot of things in his or her or their rangy life. They're looking at a wide sky. They're in a position to go, hmm, those stars, I can see a bigger picture there. That bit of sky kind of looks like a horse with a bow and arrow. That I can navigate by. David Epstein wrote a, book, a great book called Range for all us generalists. And he discovered that generalizing is really a, an, an effective strategy in life. The most creative scientists have multiple pots on the boil. 
And those people who have traveled widely solve, solve puzzles more ingeniously when they get back, it turns out. People with a wide range of knowledge are way better able to tackle problems that they have never seen. This is called knowledge transfer. A few years ago, I had the privilege of meeting this fellow. This is Michael Houghton, who won the Nobel Prize in medicine for discovering the virus that causes hep C, hepatitis C. Michael bagged hep C, and it took him 15 years. And he came at it from every angle, switching tacks as his funding ran out. He told me, want to know what the path to a major discovery is? It's getting a whole lot of data points from all the ways you failed. Trying a whole lot of stuff that didn't work and kind of interrogating why it didn't work. That's sometimes called combinatorial creativity. And a lot of people think it's, it's what we're talking about when we talk about intuition. Your subconscious mind has seen things. It knows things. Intuition feels spiritual. And it is spiritual in the sense that it's a gathering up of everything that is in us, everyone we've ever met, everything we've ever read. And that stance, of, that saying yes to everything, yes to p the potential virtues of everything that comes your way, no to options killing judgment, no to no, that is a spiritual act. And you know what else is a spiritual act? And I'm gonna, I don't know whether we do this on a regular basis, but I'm gonna suggest, I think it's, a, it's a spiritual act to stand when you've been sitting. If, you, if you're able to right now, let's all stand for a second and just, I, we, this may not be something we want to do regularly, but I feel like it's good. We've been in our heads. Let's get in our bodies. Just stretch out. And we'll just take a minute. When I was on tour with the Olga book, which was kind of about um, the, the, the virtues of not sitting too much. We used to do this on a regular basis. It's a bit of a stretch here, but I think a stretch. I, but I'll, I think it's a good idea. So let's just one back. And then we'll go to part two of this. Okay, thank you so much for indulging me there. I wanted to stretch, really. Okay. A species that over-specializes is doomed. An, eco, an ecosystem that over-specializes is doomed. Our beloved golden retriever Penny didn't make it past age nine. She got cancer. That's the way with goldens and really all purebreds with their specialized DNA. They're here for a good time, not a long time. Mutts, mutts do better. Mutts are genetically sturdier. They endure. So you'd think the same would apply to a mutt faith like ours. And you wondered where I was going with that. <laughs> and yet, it doesn't seem to. The foxes are getting outcompeted by the hedgehogs here. So Isaiah Berlin said the, the hedgehogs have an advantage. The singular defense of the hedgehog will always beat the piecemeal defenses of the fox. And this is the secret of the major religions. They have a singular defense. It's the promise of salvation. And on the flip side, the, the threat of some kind of punishment if you drift from the program. We don't have that. We don't offer that. We offer no promises. We threaten no punishments. That's kind of a murkier incentive system. Hardly a grabber for folks making energy choices on a Sunday morning. So here's a question for you. Which are there more, which are there more of in Canada, Unitarians or McDonald's franchises? <laughs> it's... It's kind of a trick question because I'm poking you one. The answer, the answer is there are more Unitarians, but it's close. <laughs> so we're not exactly growing here. No mainstream Western faith is growing, but we're really not growing. But as you know, and I know, sales figures aren't always the best measure, measure of the intrinsic value of things. Some quite nasty things grow massive, and some very good things that deserve to thrive, die on the vine. So there was a big recent study looking at originality in academic research papers. And by the way, a hat tip to Adam Grant uh, for this bit of bringing this to my attention. Adam Grant is everyone's favorite psychologist. He's kind of the Mary Oliver of psychologists. Anyway, he's, he's, as he said, an international team worked on this study of path-breaking research papers. They analyzed half a million papers, and they classified each one as novel or not novel. 
A paper was deemed novel if it cited two other journals that had never appeared before together. Just one in ten papers made that cut. Academics tend to like to stay in their lanes. Only one in twenty made multiple new knowledge combinations. So what they were left with was this trove of truly original papers, one that, ones that build bridges between disparate ideas. Let's call these papers foxes. And then the researchers wanted to know, so what is the story of these papers? How were they created? How did they come about? And what happened after they were released into the wild? Well, it turned out that these original papers, these foxes, were less likely to be funded, and after they scratched and clawed their way to publication, they were less likely to appear in prestigious journals, and after publication, they were more likely to be ignored. No fair! But there's a happier twist. When you followed these papers down the road a bit, their fortunes changed. They started to gain traction. After three years, these papers with the new knowledge combinations, these foxes, were attracting way more attention than the hedgehog papers. And after 15 years, they were way more likely to be in the top 1% of most cited papers. So in the long run, these papers were likely to be, as Adam put it, a smash hit in the library of human knowledge. So that's awesome news if you're the fox. Vindication, the long, the long game looks good. Range will out in the end. But none of that helps the fox right now. Right now, the fox is kind of starving to death. He may not make it. So, can Unitarianism make it? Can we hang in there long enough for enough people to discover its virtues at a time when it's needed more than ever, when people are fleeing church in droves, but they still have social and intellectual and, dare we say, spiritual needs that are not being met? Folks, we need to talk this fox up. Of course, when I say that, that's like asking Unitarians to roll in broken glass. We are, we are allergic to self-promotion. No Unitarian outside P.T. Barnum has ever been eager to do it. In fact, it's the proselytizing that other faiths do that a lot of us ran screaming from. My Catholic friend Barrett, who used to be in a high-pressure sales job, shared a term that stuck with me. Commission breath. It comes wafting off sales agents at the end of the month when you really have to make your quota. Customers can smell it. That's... <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> Commission breath. It sounds horrible. So we, say, so we say to newcomers, hey, we love it that you're here. We'd love it if you came again. But friend, you are under absolutely no obligation to buy. And also, friend, I want to be clear that you use have no claim on the truth. Have you noticed that Unitarian pulpits are off-center? That's because this is not the word of God. It's the, word, it's the voice of people. Human people. It's a chorus of voices of everyone who came here looking to make meaning together. And that holds whether you're a theist or an atheist, whether you believe we're holy human prototypes taking dictation from the angels, or kind of on our own here, enforcing our own set of sandlot rules, trying to keep the game safe and hopefully fun. I think of what we're doing here as cultivating a wisdom practice which is different from a meditation practice, and it's different from church the way we grew up with, some of us. What we're building is, I think, and I like this phrase, is with Krista Tippett phrase, I'm gonna steal it from her. What we're building is a kind of muscular hope, and it comes from absorbing the stories of, of how others found a way through their own struggles. To me, this is what going wide really means. It means we hear, and when I say hear, I mean really hear as many stories as possible, as, as many kinds of stories as possible, from as many cultures and traditions as possible, and even people we disagree with, so that they all triangulate on some kind of felt sense of how to live a commendable and a compassionate life. And then, this is the hard part, to go out and try to live it. And that, to my mind, is the model not just for doing church here going forward, but for healing the rifts out in the wider world. And it is the antidote to judgment and bigotry and hate. Reza Aslan said something the other day that made me jot it down. Have you heard of him? He's an Iranian-American religious scholar and author of A Human History of God, among other books. And he's a very funny guy, by the way, too. He said, people get bigotry wrong. Bigotry isn't the result of ignorance. 
there are some extremely knowledgeable bigots and racists out there. No, bigotry isn't the result of ignorance. Bigotry is the result of fear. And fear is impervious to information. It's impervious to data. The only way to dispel fear is through relationships. And we rock at that, I think. We do relationships well. We try to be good hosts. We welcome all comers. In fact, that's our principle number one plus principle number four, the inherent worth and dignity of all people plus free search for your own truth and meaning. But that's also part of the rap against us. It's like, wait a sec. If everyone is welcome in your barn, who are you really? Your group has no identity at all. But that's not actually true. When you welcome all comers, that stance of radical openness is your identity. This isn't a clubhouse for people like us. I think the eight principles together make a kind of scaffolding that attracts big, big open-minded and big-hearted humans. But there can be a lot of different kinds of people who fit that bill. To Reza's point, I think that if your own search for truth and meaning led you to become an actual bigot, the kind of person who would be uranium, uranium in the soup around here, then I think you yourself would figure out after a few visits that this place wasn't a very good fit for you and you'd find somewhere else to be on a Sunday morning. And that may be a naive or aspirational thing to say, but I really do believe it. Who here has been to Elliot? Camp at Seabank, yeah, fair number of you. So for those who don't know, it's a, that's a Unitarian camp at Seabeck in Washington State. We've been a couple of times, and this summer we went again in July. And the first night we were sitting on the porch chatting. There's a lot of sitting on the porch chatting at Elliott. And one fellow named Ted Kay, who was in a rocking chair holding a banjo, was sort of the center of gravity. Ted has been coming to Elliott for over 50 years, every year. He was the first person to sign the guest book at First Unitarian in Portland when it opened, when he was 12. And we were talking about how Unitarianism is a faith that people choose, not one that typically that they're born into. And someone asked Ted how his family found Unitarianism. And he began to spin a yarn on that night. And I tried to make a, that harp sound effect for you go back in time. I couldn't figure it out. It's 1942. America has jumped into the war, and Ted's cousin is conscripted to go fight the Nazis. He's sent overseas. First week, he's in the barracks with all the other soldiers. Sunday morning comes, time for religious services. Everyone disperses to their particular corner of the camp. Lutherans over there, Catholics over there, Jews over there. Ted's cousin dutifully reports to the tent with the Jews. The rabbi running the service starts things off by going around the room. Tell me your name, please, and where you worship. Everyone checks in, comes around to Ted's cousin, and he says, Temple Emmanuel in San Francisco. And the rabbi visibly flinches. And he says, isn't that the one with Rabbi Reichart? Now, it turns out Rabbi Reichart was a bit of a black sheep at the time. Unlike many influential Jews at the time, he was not a Zionist. He was an assimilationist. He thought instead of a Jewish homeland somewhere else, Jews should build a community where they are. So Ted's cousin says, yes, that's indeed the temple I attend. And now the rabbi starts turning a shade of purple, and he says, you're no Jew, out you go. And suddenly, Ted's cousin finds himself out in the yard, all alone, and the camp chaplain spots him walking across the quad, looking like he's just been pulled through a knothole backwards. And the chaplain says, my good man, why aren't you in your service? And Ted's cousin explains that he got kicked out. And he tells the whole story to the chaplain, how he's just been told that he's no Jew. And now he's not sure what he is or who he is. And the chaplain listens sympathetically, and then he nods and says, I think I know the place for you. And he takes him by the arm, and he walks him over to a tiny tent across the camp where the Unitarians are meeting. And that was it. At that moment, these, this one branch of this family, the K branch, swam over to the good ship UU. On the last night there at Elliott, there's always a talent show. And this year was a pretty good one. There were a couple of songs. 
There was a demonstration of the, this strange kind of yoga that's kind of acrobatics and yoga. There was a bit of comedy. Someone did a haunting solo demonstration of buto, which is an avant-garde Japanese dance form. It was a real mixed bag. I kept looking over at Ted, who was helping with the tech, and he was struggling to fight off tears half the time because his kids and his kids' kids kept coming up there to do some impossibly cute or cheesy or altogether Unitarian thing. And then suddenly, up on stage, is Lila. Lila was with us on that trip, and she was off with the youth every morning, so we didn't see much of her. And earlier in that day, the, the older youth had bridged out in a private little ceremony, and some of them were coming up to say a few words. Lila, I'm going to call you up and put you on the spot, if I may, to share with us what you, what you said. <laughs> and first of all, you didn't have a lot of prep for this, did you? No. You were pretty much writing it on, on your phone, on the, practically on the way up to the microphone. Yeah. yeah. I'm... I'm going to say, I'm going to turn it over to you. And here you are, here's your words. I printed them in case you didn't have. Yeah. I can use this one. Thank you. This is called On Connection. The Greeks believe there is a golden string of life binding us all together. The Japanese believe the string is red. Buddhists believe the string is karma, and many UUs believe the string is love. With all these strings crisscrossing around the globe, it's easy to get tied up sometimes. Connection isn't always tidy. It frays and grays. People leave, and strangers become friends, become family. We feel connection when someone saves us a seat, when we hear our name in a smiling mouth, sitting together, interlocked hands, a flicker of eye contact. Connection is invisible and indivisible. Somewhere, our strings are forming a beautiful tapestry. We are here together. We are here together. This is enough. I think that has to be the last word. Deanna? The water is white I cannot cross over And either half I wings to fly Build me a boat That will carry two And both shall row my love and I, there is a ship, and she sails the sea. She slowed the deep, as steep can be, but not so deep as the love of me. Not how I sink or swim deep river. My home is so ground deep river my home is over Jordan Ooh, 
deep river, Lord. I want to grow so very in to come ground. Reach the recipient this month is the Edible Garden Project of North Shore Neighborhood House. That's where 100% of our, our offering plate will go today unless you specify other. This charity grows fresh vegetables and it partners with local food security organizations to distribute them to those in need in our community. Please give as generously as you are able. Would the ushers please come forward? Announcements. It wouldn't be opening day at the ballpark without the traditional corn roast, and Diane Hicks has come through for us again on that. Please join us downstairs after the service if you are able. I'm pre pleased to announce that the new upstairs bathroom is operational. <laughs> too, too late for Francis, unfortunately, but uh, I know many of you will appreciate it. Next Sunday, this looks like a not to miss service by Rebecca Lindley. She's calling it a path forward and a shield. It's about hope, um, muscular hope if you like. Not an easy thing to find in these times, but an important one. And now I'm gonna invite up Barry Forbes, your president for a message from the board. If I may, thanks Barry. Thank you, Bruce. Welcome, everybody. It's so nice to see familiar faces and new faces. So thank you all for coming. And uh, we really hope that you enjoyed today's service, Bruce. I think you did hit it all out of the park. There's no question about that today. It was outstanding. So when there's a message from the board, they usually try and tell you what they've been doing, right? So this summer has been relatively busy around here, believe it or not. Bruce already mentioned the washroom, uh, and uh, the result of the washroom change is that the sound booth had to move to the sanctuary. And um, you may have seen Brian McConnell and I running around like chickens here this morning because it just wasn't quite working right, but we got it. We got it right at the last moment, so we now know what we're doing, we think. I gotta tell you too, you gotta look this way to the southwest corner here. This is all brand new. Those windows were falling, they were 
crooked. There were all kinds of stuff. Then there was a hazard on the stairs going down. We put a new door in. We put a new, the whole thing was open most of the summer. And now all those beautiful windows are now beautifully displayed. So uh, we've got to thank Brian Wellwood for managing that, that uh, project. Also, uh, he was a bit of a lumberjack this summer too, Brian Wellwood. He uh, removed a number of trees that are out, out front, that were out front. There were nine or eleven of them, I can't remember which it was. They started out as little hedges and then they grew up the big, great big trees that were causing havoc on the roof. And uh, you may have noticed or may not have noticed that the uh, front hallway here, um, we've, we've done a little bit of painting on that. We haven't finished painting it, but uh, thanks to Yvonne and Joanna yesterday, they were, uh, they were here doing that. So uh, they were very busy. So that's kind of the physical stuff that's been happening. Also, uh, what else did we do? There was one other thing we did. Oh yeah, new boiler, new boiler. And what else? Oh yeah, there's a great big cottonwood that fell on a shed over here. And uh, it was uh, taken out over the summer. So, uh, so we've been, like I say, Brian, um, Brian Wellwood was a bit of a lumberjack. Um, the second thing we've done is we've, we've embarked on an organizational review. Now, we did this because we thought we had a very successful year last year. And we were very excited about the services, the, the way the Sunday services were, the direction that we're going. And Honestly, we think we're kind of the best kept secret on the North Shore. Um, and that's a shame, when, especially when you get guys like Bruce Gerson here talking to us every Sunday morning. So we want to make people more aware of who we are. And we are meeting with marketing companies in, the next, in this month to talk about how we can get a message to people who are interested in becoming part of our community. And uh, so, you're going to stay tuned for that because on the 6th of October we're going to have a town hall meeting and at that town hall meeting you're going to be given an opportunity to, to hear about what we've done and to give us feedback on what you what you think we should be doing. Um, also you thank you very much for, for uh, completing the survey that uh, that we asked you to complete and uh, we're taking that into consideration when we look at where we go. Um, the next thing is we have a couple of new faces within the organization. Um, as many of you know, Tom Fullerton, Fullerton worked for us as, as the custodian and he left our, our um, services this year. Um, and so we have a new cleaning service. His name is Ray. If you see, if you come in here on a Friday night or a Saturday, he cleans the place, does a beautiful job. Uh, we're very excited about having him. But the position that's more uh, exciting is a position called the church factotum. Now, does anybody know what a factotum is? For those of you who forgot your grade eight Latin, it is someone who does everything. <laughs> All right, a factotum is somebody who does everything. And Brian McConnell fits that description perfectly. So Brian, we welcome you. We welcome you as our church factotum, and that is his official title, so you know. There was some debate about whether he should be manager, building manager, whatever, but he likes church factotum, so that's who he is. And finally, what's that? There's what? There's an opera song called factotum. Okay, well, Brian will sing an opera song, I'm sure, before he's done. And finally, we have to welcome Steele Curry over there as our Sunday Services Facilities Coordinator. <laughs> Steele replaces Annabelle um, Coward, who was here and is now in Ontario taking classes. Um, Steele is the son of David Curry. For those of you who have been around as long as I have, who will remember David and Allie. And um, he's the spitting image of Marcus. So uh, anyway, that's just an aside. Um, <laughs> also, I'd like to welcome Chris Miller to the board. She is uh, our newest board member. She replaced Liz Moffat, who did an outstanding job. And uh, we're very happy to have you here, Chris. So, um, absolutely. So as Bruce already mentioned, there is a um, after church gathering downstairs. Corn, I can smell the burgers burn burning right now. Um, and we have Barbara Kroon's husband to thank for that. Thank you, Barb, for volunteering Elko. 
Um, Diane Hicks is, does a marvelous job. The corn is great. The burgers are good. The company is fabulous. So any of you who are new, come down, enjoy. Anyone is who is new doesn't have to pay for lunch. So that's just part of the service. I'm sorry, Chris. And yes, you can use your credit card. We now have the capability of using credit cards. It's $5 by donation. And uh, we ask you to, uh, to enjoy yourself. Because, and, and you know, I, I got to tell you, one of the things I hear often is, is that um, people who are new here are, I don't know, nervous or uncomfortable often being amongst us. And for those of you who are new here, please, please come downstairs. And if, if too many people are running towards you, just tell them to stop. If not enough people are running towards you, tell them to run. All right? And uh, Bruce, I love being a fox. Keep up the good work. I won't call you the silver fox. I guess. Oh, I did. Sorry. All right. As we're coming in to, for, to, for a landing here, it's our uh, time for our final congregational hymn. It's familiar to many of you, most of you, everyone. 1064 in your program, Blue Boat Home. it and that's all as they used to say in the brasseries of old Montreal I love that we're back together again thank you to everyone who made this service possible I see some newcomers thank you for taking a chance on us and now it's time to extinguish our chalice we extinguish this flame the light the world calls us to live with depth, meaning, and purpose. We go forth with courage and love.
going to be a great year. And I'll ask, if you're comfortable with this, to take the hand of the person next to you as we close around for our final ritual.